Hello everyone, this is Richard from Modern Health Span. During our interview with Professor Cuervo, she mentioned a new drug that her lab was working on. They have now published the paper talking about this research. Let's have a quick look at the paper before getting into the interview where she gives some background on the study. When the paper was published, the Albert Einstein College of Medicine issued a press release. Experimental drug shows potential against Alzheimer's disease. Here is the paper, which was published in Cell on April the 22nd. Chaperone-mediated autophagy prevents collapse of the neuronal metastable proteome, which roughly means that CMA helps maintain the protein environment in the brain. The components in our cells which maintain the correct protein environment deteriorate as we get older, and the lack of protein quality control is linked to neurodegeneration. Chaperone-mediated autophagy, or CMA, is a key part of the protein quality control. By blocking CMA in mice, they showed the same symptoms as aging in the brain, which exacerbated Alzheimer's. On the other hand, chemically upregulating CMA ameliorates the symptoms in mice in two different models of Alzheimer's disease. We talked about CMA earlier in our interview with Professor Cuervo, so I won't go over the mechanism again. But very briefly, the CMA protein attaches to the protein to be degraded and brings it to the lysosome. Here, LAMP2A is required to bring the target protein into the lysosome for degradation. As we get older, LAMP2A is downregulated, which inhibits CMA's ability to clear up the misfolded proteins. The paper describes a new drug called CA, which upregulates LAMP2A and allows CMA to continue to function. The study showed that mice with a propensity for Alzheimer's showed improved memory, depression and anxiety as well as walking ability when they were treated with the drug. One of the effects of the misfolded proteins remaining in the brain cell is that they gather in clumps, which are shown here in yellow and are believed to be related to the reduction in brain function. We can see that the treatment reduced the levels of these protein clumps. It should be noted that studies of humans with Alzheimer's have shown the same buildup of proteins as are seen here in the mouse model. Professor Gavathiotis was the co-leader of the study and led development of the drug. The treatment did not appear to have any adverse effects on other organs when given daily for an extended period of time. The doctors have teamed up with Life Biosciences and founded a company, Selfagy Therapeutics, to continue development of the drug and bring it to market. So things are looking very positive. Let's hear what Professor Cuervo has to say about the study and next steps. So I'd like to turn to autophagy in the brain, because I, I believe this was an area that you looked at. And we, we kind of touched about on it about sleeping and, and the brain recovering and um, sort of cleaning up the proteins. And so within the brain, we, you know, we, we have Alzheimer's and Parkinson's, which happen more as you get older because of a protein buildup. Uh, so is this related to autophagy and autophagy not functioning correctly? And can you kind of talk about that a bit? Yeah, so of course, I mean, those diseases are always multifactorial, mm. but I think evidence, not only from our labs, but many other labs that are now studying that, it really points out that, failure of autophagy is a big component of those diseases. And if you think about that, for example, in Alzheimer's or in Parkinson, there is a fraction of the patients that, I mean, they have a mutation in a protein and this protein is continuously misfolding and it will tend to accumulate. But of course, when you are young, these individuals don't have any symptoms because your autophagy is very good in eliminating these proteins. As soon as this misfolded protein occurs, let's clean it up, let's clean it up. So we think that these are age-related diseases because as autophagy decrease, then the, with the same amount of mutant protein or abnormal protein, you end accumulating more because you cannot eliminate it through autophagy. So as a proof of concept, we have developed an animal uh, in which we prevent this decline with age on autophagy. So basically they are gonna have proper autophagy per life using genetic tools. And then when we cross them with these models of neurodegeneration, the animals are asymptomatic for a while longer time because they are able to maintain the autophagy as where they were young. And of course, we are not gonna be doing these interventions in people. We are not gonna do gene therapy in an 80 year old with Alzheimer, but having these models have convinced us first and then hopefully to pharma and convinced that 
modulating this pathway, maintaining the same autophagy that when you were young, you don't need to go much more than that, is enough to prevent the onset of symptoms and to maintain it asymptomatic the same way that these people were when they were young. So part of our development of drugs is now trained to do that, preserve chaperone-mediated autophagy in our case, the same activity through life, so you don't have this decline with age, and hopefully that will be enough to span, like health span, right? Like healthy mm -hmm. lifespan without not onset of these age-related diseases. And it applies obviously to neurodegeneration, diseases of the brain, but also metabolic diseases of aging, like diabetes or atherosclerosis, because in a way, as I mentioned, this decrease of course in so many tissues that if you can bring autophagy to the normal levels when you were young, that might prevent other diseases too. Right. So the, the drugs you're looking at, so we, we talked a little bit about uh, rapamycin and metformin, um, so, but the drugs you're looking at, they work in a different way or is... Um, it, yeah, so, so the, those yeah. are completely yeah different ways. So rapamycin and spermidine or metformin um, is part of the initiative of using drugs or medicines that are already used in the clinic and trying to repurpose them to activate autophagy because many of the things that we prescribe every day in the clinic, they also have ability to activate autophagy. So that was the whole idea of, of these drugs. But the problem with those ones is that sometimes you really don't know the mechanism of action. The advantage is that they are already in the clinic so you can start applying them very fast, but they are not so selective as we would like. Because, for example, rapamycin adds in one of the major nutrient sensors in the cell, right? Like TOR, mTOR. So you are going to change so many other things in addition of autophagy that, you know, some of them might be good, but some of them might not be so good. So what we are doing as a, as a field, and in particular in my lab, is to design specific molecules that are able to only activate autophagy, not the other side effects of these drugs. And of course, the, the good side is that they are very selective and they work beautifully. The bad side is that you have to do clinical trials, you have to do toxicity, you have to do everything. Meanwhile, with the others, since they are already used in clinic, rapamycin is used every day in the clinic, you can bring it to patients quite faster. So you have to kind of pick and choose. It's like, do you want the drugs to go very fast to patients and be less selective? Or do you want selectivity? And then you will have to do all this long process of five to seven years to develop a, a compound. So we are halfway there. In our lab, we are doing some repurposing of compounds that are already used in the clinic. But our main emphasis right now is some small molecules that we design in collaboration with an amazing chemist, Evris Gavathiotis at Einstein, and that we have tried so far in animal models, but they look very promising. Interesting. So, so the molecules, are they, are you targeting specific diseases or? So, I, yeah, yeah. That's, a that's a very good point because I mean, you can do this two ways. You can go disease by disease and say, okay, I'm going to develop something to increase cleaning of the protein that is abnormal in Parkinson. Uh, or you can develop something to um, um, improve the protein that is altered in Alzheimer's. In, in our case, we went for the common theme. So the, the common theme there is that independently of what is the protein that aggregates and that misfolds and misbehaves inside your cell, autophagy is always the one taking it out. And it was taking it out very efficiently when these patients were young because they don't have any symptoms. So rather than going disease by disease, we kind of want to tackle autophagy. So in that case, it will be the same drug to activate autophagy in different contexts. And what changed is like, what is the protein that has built up on those patients? In some cases, it will be alpha-synuclein if it's Parkinson. In other cases, it will be tau if it's Alzheimer. And of course, the, the interesting part of that is that you can use similar compounds. Probably they will have to have different way of delivering, but we have tested some of these drugs for neurodegenerative disorders but also, for example, for diseases of the eye that are also based on buildings or material or some diseases, you know, systemic diseases that are also, for example, in developing of bone marrow and hematopoiesis, you, you also need to have your stem cells should be as good as possible. And when you are old, 
that doesn't happen. And we found that if we restore autophagy, that's enough to also enhance this function of stem cells. So, so the drugs are specifically targeting autophagy, and then it's probably the dose and the frequency and the delivery method that will have to be adapted depending on the disease. Okay. I, I mean, would they be appropriate for just for aging without a specific disease? Maybe when you yeah. finally, when they finally get released. So that's that's our big dream in aging, as you know, is not to make people to live longer; it's to make people to be longer time healthier. And of course, that requires preventing interventions. I mean, so far we are just talking about treating once mm. people are sick. But what we want is the next generation to don't have to get sick, right? To prevent. Right. But as you know, because of the regulations, the FDA doesn't approve. I mean, everything has to be approved as a clinical trial. And in order to do that, you have to have a condition, a, a disease, a pathology mm. that you have to measure to show uh, success. So the big triumph so far has been the study with metformin. I'm not sure if you have heard about TAME. So this mm. is a study that has been initiated by uh, Nir Varsilai, that is co-director of the Aging Center with me. I, I have not been involved on, on the study, but I'm very familiar because of him. And the whole idea is to use metformin. That is something that many people with diabetes takes every day. Uh, use it as a prevention uh, and in, in a particular group of population and then measure some parameters in two years of treatment. So one of the requirements, for example, for FDA is that you can measure any outcome except glucose in blood because the, the drug, that's what it's for. So you don't need to do another clinical trial for something that the drug is for, but then they are gonna be measuring a metabolic output, a strength, a frailty in general. So they are gonna use parameters that are not related to glucose metabolism because that's already the indication of that drug. So it's more at the regulatory level that becomes complicated and that's why this kind of divulgation that you guys do here is very important to educate everybody about what do we want to do in aging research? And it's really prevention, it's really to have a healthy aging. And you know, if they tell you once you hit 50, you're gonna have to take this cleaning pill once a month, people will do it if that's gonna extend your time free of disease for 20 years more, right? So, but that requires a change in mentality and also a change in policy that hopefully the more people in the global population gets aware of this, they will be able to put some pressure on, on the regulatory agencies. Right, yes. So how, so you, you said you were about halfway through your drugs uh, and you said seven years. So, so I mean, do you have like a, an idea of when you would have something? Or yeah, so, so, and this is actually not me, I, I, I'm just an, an academic investigator, but because these compounds were looking so promising, um, we developed a startup company that then was absorbed by Real Pharma, so Life Bioscience, and basically they are the ones developing them as real medicines, as mm -hmm. real drugs. So we are helping on the scientific part, um, but the whole idea is that they are developing more chemical matter because you have to have a variety. As you know, many of these compounds fell through the cracks as you advance in the, in the studies, mm. but uh, toxicity studies have been done and no toxicity so far. So we are extremely excited about that part. Efficacy has been tested in animal models. So I think that in the next year, the goal is to start a small clinical trial Yes, phase one, yes, mm -hmm. for no toxicity in humans, but hopefully it will be designed in a way that you might get some outcomes of efficacy. So we are, at this moment, we are gonna focus in diseases of the eye um, because of aging, macular degeneration is one of the, I mean, it's not life threatening, but it completely diminish your quality of life. And, you know, much part of our elder population have problems with sight because of macular degeneration. So that's one of the first diseases that we are going to be targeting. Okay, interesting. And you think the underlying cause of macular degeneration is or lack of autophagy? So we think one of the causes, so that's a typical example where like three mm. or four things coincide and make a big mess. But by intervening, at least in the animal models, but intervening in autophagy, we are able to restore sight, or, or at least to preserve, I should say, to preserve sight. 
So that's, of course, in an animal model. And we have cured animal models many times. So the question is whether it's going to happen the same in humans. But, you know, we are very cautious about the whole thing, but optimistic on the idea that, you know, the animal models look very good. We know that autophagy is failing in the people with the disease because we have done some analysis post-mortem. Uh, so hopefully if it works the same way that in the mice, uh, we might be able to have some success with that disease. Yeah. Okay, interesting. I hope that you found the video informative. Please do hit the thumbs up button and subscribe to our channel and hit the bell button and choose all for any new video release notifications. It encourages us to continue to create more videos about anti-aging and extending healthy lifespan. Thank you so much for your kind support. I wish you all well and we'll speak to you again soon. <music>